Good morning, Harvard Heights. How's everybody doing? Well, we have a lot of families out on spring break, students out, families out. So if you're joining us online, wherever the camera's at, uh, and you're on spring break, uh, we're holding the fort down here. Ain't that right, guys? We're holding it down. Don't fear. Um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4 today. Acts chapter 4, we're continuing through our Acts series. So Acts 4, we're going to be looking in verses 32 and 37. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Give you a second to turn there. When I was in college, uh, I, was, I was a follower of Jesus, but I wasn't living like one. I wasn't living my life to exalt Jesus. And if people looked at my life, yeah, they would say he's a churchgoer, he, he knows the Bible, he, he knows Jesus, but I don't know if I would say he's living his life to exalt Jesus. And I'm going to use that word exalt Jesus a lot today. And simply what I mean with that is to make Jesus known. We, we live our lives to point to Jesus, to, to magnify Jesus. And think about it, Jesus is so awesome, he's so great, he's so glorious that when you make Jesus known, he's exalted and he is worshipped. And so I wasn't living like that in college to exalt Jesus. I was, it was a season of indulging in sin, a, a season of trying to impress people, a season of, of still living enslaved to sin, to this world, to myself. I had my plan and what I wanted to do. And uh, there's two things that really summarized my, my heart during the season. And the first one is my only goal for after college is find a good job in accounting so I could buy a Range Rover. <laughs> Not because I love Range Rovers, because I wanted to show it off. I wanted to show my friends, look how cool I am. I'm living it up in Nashville while you guys are in small town, Tennessee. And the second thing is uh, I remember coming home from church one, one day and, and I felt Jesus calling me to just surrender my life to him. Not surrender in a, uh, a salvation way, I don't think, but surrender as in to tell him these exact words, Jesus, I, I will go wherever you want me to go and I'll do whatever you want me to do. And you know what I didn't do? I didn't pray that prayer. You know why? Because if I had prayed that, it probably means no Range Rover, right? I wanted that Range Rover. I had, I had my own plan. I had my five-year plan. I had what I wanted to do. I don't want to live my life to exalt Jesus. I wouldn't have said that out loud. But that's how I was living my life. And so I want to ask you today, what about you? What about you today? If... If you're here this morning, you say, 10 out of 10, I have a relationship with Jesus by faith in him. I'm following Jesus, but man, I don't know if my life looks like it. I don't know if I'm living my life to exalt Jesus. I, I still live enslaved to sin. I, I still live enslaved to this world. And I don't know what that is for you. I can't judge your heart. That's between you and God. But you need to ask yourself this morning. You need to look at your life and say, man, am I living my life to make Jesus known? Am I living my life to point to Jesus? Because this is what we're going to see in our passage today. In Acts chapter 4, we're going to see this. The early church, we're going to get a cool glimpse into the early church. People who were following Jesus, and they were living like it. They were living like it. These were people that were living their lives exalting Jesus. Like they were selling their Range Rovers to help out people in need. They were saying with their hearts, like, Jesus, we'll do whatever you want us to do. We'll go wherever you want us to go. Because here's the thing for me, in college, I was free in Jesus. But I wasn't living in that freedom that Jesus offers. So that's, that's what I want to call us to today. I want to call us today, as followers of Jesus, I want to call us to live out our freedom in Jesus so that we will live to make him known. We'll live our lives to exalt Jesus. Because here's the reality. I love Colossians 1 verse 16. Because maybe you're not sold on that yet. Maybe you're not sold on my life is to magnify Jesus. First Colossians verse, verse 16. I love it because it gives us the purpose of our lives. It says, all things, all things, it's including you and me, all things have been made through Jesus and for Jesus. 
We've been made for Jesus. To live for him, to make him known, to know him, to glorify him. He's the savior of the world, not us, not you, and not me. And so what I want to do today in our passage, we're going to see three things. We're going to see three things that Jesus sets us free from so that we can live to make him known. And what I, what I think you'll see today is that these three things, the things that even as followers of Jesus, we can still struggle with them today. And they can keep us from living to exalt Jesus. So today I want to show you that Jesus has come to set us free from these things so that we can live to make him known. And so we're continuing through our Acts series. We, we saw last week uh, the early church praying for boldness to what? To proclaim Jesus with their lives. They were praying for boldness in opposition of threats, in, in face of opposition, in face of threats. And what does God do? He, he gives them boldness through the power of the Holy Spirit so that they will proclaim Jesus. And then we're picking up right in the next passage. And so Acts 4, 32 through 37, let's get it. Now the entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. Just see how their, their lives are exalting Jesus. But instead, they held everything in common. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them because... All those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as any had need. We're now about to be introduced to an important character in the book of Acts, Barnabas. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement. Barnabas sold a field he owned, brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. This is God's word for God's people. God, speak to us. So today I want to show us three things that Jesus has come to set us free from so that we can live to exalt him. And so my first point is sin. Jesus has come to free us from sin. To fill us with his Holy Spirit so that we can live to exalt him. Notice in verse 32 how it says... Now the entire group of those who believed. The entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind. So who made up the people here? Was this just any people that was living in this great generosity and this great unity? Was this just anybody? No, these were people who believed. This was the church. Who makes up the church today? People who believe. Believe in what? Verse 33, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was on all of them. So these were people who were believing in the resurrection of Jesus. They were believing in the gospel of Jesus. And this is where we find our ultimate freedom. That we have all sinned against God and so we're separated from God. In our sin, and we can't live to know God. We can't live to exalt God in our sin. But what has God done? The good news of the Bible is that God has come himself as Jesus in the flesh to pay the price for our sins so that we can live with God. And guess what? When you live with God, you know what you do? You exalt God because he is so glorious and he is so great. And so Jesus He's come. He's paid the price for our sins on the cross. He's paid that price. Me and you couldn't pay it. He died in tomb. And you know what happened next? He resurrected from the dead. Jesus is alive. And so think about this. Jesus is alive. That's what we believe. That's our hope. And so the one who is calling us in the scriptures to follow him is alive. And he's saying, follow me, live for me, exalt me. Jesus is alive. He, he defeated sin. He defeated death. God accepted 
his sacrifice on our behalf on the cross. And now Jesus offers to everyone, everyone, whoever believes in me will be forgiven of their sins for good and be restored back to God in a loving relationship. If you're not a follower of Jesus here today, if you're not certain, 10 out of 10, I have a relationship with Christ. And put your trust in Jesus today. Be forgiven of your sin. Be free from your sin so that you can live with God. So that you can live out Colossians 1.16 for Jesus. This is the good news. Now I want to talk to followers of Jesus here. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're free from sin. You're free from sin. The sin that, that was leading us to death, the sin that was keeping us from knowing God, we're free from it. What does that mean, free from sin? Well, one, it means sin no longer rules over us. Sin no longer rules over us. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin will not rule over you. Because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Sin no longer rules over us to where I have to obey sin. No, I know a better way, Jesus and Jesus is far better than what sin offers. Sin no longer rules me. Jesus now rules over me. This also means that sin no longer defines us. Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that not good news? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus when we're Apart from Jesus, in our sin, sin defines us. Sin is heading, leading us to death. In our sin, before God, we deserve his judgment and his wrath. But by faith in Jesus, by the grace of God, by faith in Jesus, we, Jesus gives us his righteousness. We're forgiven of our sin. And now we can stand in the presence of God where he delights in us and he knows us. And Jesus now defines us. And he says, you are loved, you are forgiven, and you are mine. And there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when you mess up and you keep messing up, the good news is there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That sin that you keep messing up with no longer defines you. But see this, you're free from that sin. Because <laughs> here's the reality. As followers of Jesus, when we continue to pursue sin, and this can be a, a season thing, this can be a, a daily thing, but we can't, you can't exalt Jesus when we're doing sinful things. Like, think about it. Like, you're at work, you have that coworker that it just, they make your skin crawl. Like, you can't stand them. And let's be honest, this is a strong word, but like, you would probably wouldn't admit it, but you hate them. And, like, when you see them, you want nothing good for them. Like, you want nothing good for them. That's not glorifying Jesus. Or let's say you're looking at something on the Internet you're not supposed to look at. That's not glorifying Jesus. Our sin can keep us from living to exalt Jesus. So what sin do you need to lay down today? What sin do you need to lay down today so that you can live to exalt Jesus? And listen, there's hope here for you. Because see this, Jesus is far better than what that sin can offer you. Jesus is far better than what that sin can offer you. Keep trusting in Jesus. Stay focused on Jesus. That's what the early church is doing here. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. With great power, the apostles were, were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. They, they kept focus on Jesus. They kept proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. It, it's not like they preached Jesus, you're saved, and now, okay, we're done preaching Jesus. No, I need Jesus. Every single day, I need Jesus. Like, do you need Jesus every single day as a follower of him? Like I do. So stay focused on Jesus. Keep following him. And let's lay down sins that are keeping us from exalting him and proclaiming him. And know this, that Jesus has died and resurrected from the dead to free you from that sin. The early church here, the early church, they are living in their freedom from sin in Jesus. And so this leads them to our next two points. 
So my, my second point today is this. Jesus frees us from living for ourselves. Jesus frees us from living for ourselves. Look at the passage here. Were they living for themselves? Were they pursuing their own sinful desires, their own will? No, look at verse 32. Now the entire group of those who believed were one heart and mind. It's, it's believed that the early church around this time was around eight to 10,000 people. How, how is eight to 10,000 people of one heart and mind here? No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But instead they held everything in common. What is going on here? What is this passage saying? They had one heart and mind, held everything in common, nobody held their possessions as their own. These people have found freedom in Jesus. These people have found freedom in Jesus. And we see the church here unified. What were they unified in? Were they unified around anything else or anything? No, they were unified in Jesus. So just think about this. If we're followers of Jesus, like that brings us together, doesn't it? Like we share the same Father. We share the same Savior. We've experienced the same grace. We're focusing on the same Jesus. We have the same identity. We have the same hope. One heart, one mind. Think about what, think about what brings a sports team together. What brings a sports team together? Well, love for that sport and the goal to win. What brings us together as followers of Jesus? We love Jesus. We together love Jesus. And our mission is to exalt Jesus. So as followers of Jesus, the, there's something that just brings us together. We love one another. I remember I went on my first mission journey. I think it was back in 2019. And I, I think I'll always remember this. I went to Dominica. So the, the church I was at at the time, um, we were partnered with the church in Dominica. And I remember... Like when I met these, these, these guys, when I met this church, these people in this church, it was just like immediate connection. And for a whole week, we shared meals together. We, we prayed together. We worshiped together. We laughed together. We, we worshiped together. I think I just said that. We, we shared the gospel. We did it all together for like a whole week. And we just had the best time. You're talking about people thousands of miles away. People com with complete different backgrounds, completely different cultures. What brought us together? Jesus. We all love Jesus. We all wanted to spend our lives making him known and enjoying him. Here's the thing. When, 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 I'm going to jump to your head. So not only does us following Jesus have this. Just, we just naturally gravitate towards one another. We just naturally love one another. Because here's the thing, if, if that was all we had, then I think you could have it out, right? Like, okay, yeah, they're following Jesus, but they kind of get on my nerves. So, you know, I don't really, I don't really love them. I love, I love these, them. I don't really love that person. I mean, I'm not, I don't, they're okay. I think we would have an easy out if that was it. But no. What does Jesus call us to as the church? We don't get an easy out on this, on loving one another. John 13, verse 34, Jesus says this. He's, he's talking to his disciples and he was saying, this is how as disciples you treat one another. And so we're included in this, right? We're disciples of Jesus. This is how we treat one another. Verse 34, 13, verse 34, Gospel of John. Jesus says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Love one another. But he doesn't stop there. Love one another just as I have loved you. <laughs> They're to love each other as Jesus has loved them. We are to love each other as Jesus has loved us. How has Jesus loved us? Like he's, he's given us his life. He, he died for us. He gave himself for us. But not only this. Think about all throughout the Gospels, 
Jesus walks with his disciples for years. They experience some awesome stuff together, miracles together. Jesus calms the storm when they are fearful. Jesus teaches them how to pray. He, to God, he teaches them the kingdom of God, about the kingdom of God. They shared the last supper together. Jesus loved them. And we see in John 17, we see this cool prayer of Jesus praying to God over his disciples. And you see the, Jesus' love for his disciples. We're to love one another like this. In the big universal church among all followers of Jesus. And then as the local church here at Harvard Heights, we are to love one another deeply as Jesus has loved us. And what's cool about the disciples is there's a lot of different personalities that the disciples had that they probably rubbed against each other. So in this church, there's probably personalities that rub against each other. There's probably some people that, for lack of better words, probably maybe get on our nerves. Let's just be honest. Can we just be honest with each other and be real? That people that are not easy to love, even they're following Jesus, I'm following Jesus, they're not easy to love, are called to love one another as Jesus has loved us. Like that's a deep love. Like we care for one another. And here's the thing. I don't think any of us would say we hate each other. But I think there can be a lot of lukewarm, casual love. Like this bucks up against that as well. We're not just in here just casually loving one another. We love one another deeply because of Jesus. Like see this in this church. And when we love one another like this, look in the next verse. We do this, yes, Jesus calls us, but we also do this for another reason. In John 13, 34, Jesus finishes by saying this. Listen, this is cool. Jesus says, everyone will know. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Look at them. You know, they're Jesus' disciples. There's no other way to explain it. They love one another so deeply. They are one heart, one mind. Only way to explain that is they are followers of Jesus. When we love one another deeply like this, we will exalt Jesus. Let's be this church. Let's be this church and think about this. When we're a people who different backgrounds, different stories, different cultures, different politic beliefs, different non-essential convictions. We're people that love one another despite all this deeply in a world that is quick to be divisive, that loves to be divisive, in a, a world and a culture that is quick to cancel each other out, that does not desire to show one another grace, a world that loves drama, when we're a people in light of all that, we don't fall for that. We love one another deeply. We will exalt Jesus. So let's be this people that love one another deeply. And these followers of Jesus here, they loved one another deeply because of Jesus. And this leads us to our third point. Our third point, Jesus frees us from our Stuff. Jesus frees us from our stuff. Look at the, uh, the verse 32. Verse 32. Now the entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But instead they held everything in common. Verse 34, for there is not a needy person among them. Because all those who owned lands and houses sold them. They, they brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as any had need. What was going on here in the early church? They were meeting one another's needs. There's people in the church that had great needs. And the church was meeting those needs. For there was not a needy person among them. How did they provide these needs? Believers were selling their land, selling their houses, giving the proceeds to the apostles, laying at their feet, and the apostles were distributing it to anybody who had need. And then we see in verse 36, we're introduced to, to Barnabas, like I said earlier, and Barnabas, Luke is showing Barnabas as an example here. 
And it said that Barnabas, he sold a field he owned, he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now I know what you're thinking. I think this too. Oh, they sold houses and fields. No way we're doing that today. Like, it must have been a different time. Like, what this text is not saying is that you have to sell your stuff to be followers of Jesus. No, we, we see all throughout the Acts that the church continued to meet in people's houses. Not everybody sold their houses. But let's not let ourselves off the hook because there's something beautiful here. Like, see the, the beauty in this passage. And this is what I want us to see. They weren't worshiping their stuff. Barnabas wasn't worshiping that field he sold. They weren't worshiping their houses and their fields. They weren't worshiping their stuff. They weren't finding their identity in their stuff. They weren't trusting in their stuff. How easy is it for us to fall into that? I'm there. Me and Michaela are, uh, you know, I never ask her if I can say this stuff, sorry. Um, me and Michaela, we're looking for, and this might sound, oh, me and Michaela, we're, we're looking for, um, I lost track of the, we're looking for a couch to buy. We want to buy a nice couch, we want to buy a nice sectional, and, and we were looking for one, and we almost pulled the trigger, and let's be honest, it probably would have been a lot of money for us. And so here's where my mind was. I was excited. And this might be a little exaggeration, but I think it, it, it paints the picture good. We were, we we're close to buying it, and here was my immediate thought. Oh, man, this is a nice couch. What if, what if I invite students and we have student groups in our home, and you know where this is going. I was like, oh, man, like, I don't know. What if for whatever reason they jump on it, they break it, they, they spill something, like, they can't go in, they, they got to eat in the kitchen. Like they can't bring food on the couch. And there's actually a, a lighter color that I loved. And I was like, hey, Michaela, like, I, I think we should go for a darker color. I just, <laughs> this, this is true. But, but see this, I, exaggeration probably, but I think this paints a good picture. I wasn't seeing me buying this couch, me and Michaela making our house a hospitable place for people to come and be discipled in. I wasn't excited about that. I wasn't excited about possible people being discipled. In my living room, I was more worried about them ruining the couch. Like it's so easy for us to live enslaved to our stuff. And this is what I want us to see here today. These followers of Jesus, they were holding on looser, and I'm using that. I'm using that on purpose. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing my words wisely. wisely. They're holding on to their stuff looser. And they're holding on to Jesus tighter. I'm not finding my identity in my stuff. I'm not trusting in my stuff. I'm trusting in Jesus. He's my hope, not my stuff. My stuff is, is here. It's given to me by, by God to be stewarded well for his glory. And so I'm going to hold on to Jesus tighter. He's my joy and not my stuff. And if God calls me to, to sell my stuff or to use my resources to, to bring glory to his name, then I'm going to do that because I know something greater, Jesus. Just think about this. How easy is it to, to give something away that holds lesser value? When something has less value or no value, it's easy to give it away. Think, think about a pen. Now, I know some of you have your pins that you love. You're not giving it to nobody. But I know some of you. But for, for most of us, right, somebody needs a pin. Hey, do you have a pin I could borrow? Yeah, sure. Here, have it. Take it. See this. This, this early church here, us, when we grab home tired to Jesus, when we see Jesus, he's far more valuable than our stuff. Then we start seeing the things of this world as having less value because we know those things won't save us. We know those things, we can't take it with us, but Jesus is forever. Jesus is forever. Our stuff, we can lose it. We can't lose Jesus. So we hold these things with a lesser grip, and I want to call us to do that. To hold these, our stuff, with a lesser grip, and let's grab hold tighter to Jesus. 
And let's see your stuff as, as this is given to me by God. It's not mine. And if God calls me to, to sell it, to give it away, to, to use my resources, to bring him glory, then I'm going to do that. I'm going to gladly do that. I'm going to joyfully do that. And it might be hard. There's a brother in here. Um, last year my, my car broke down. Man, there was like six months there where my car was in the shop for like five times. And so this was the start of it. Um, my car was in the shop and uh, I was just telling this to his brother. And he offered me his car for like a week. I didn't ask him. He gladly offered me his car. I've never experienced anything like that before. And let me tell you, I felt the love of Jesus in that. Jesus was exalted in that. Because I know why he did it. He did it because he loves Jesus. He did it because his heart has been changed by Jesus. He did it because he holds his stuff with a lesser grip and he's holding to Jesus tighter. And he's living his life to exalt Jesus. And this leads him to love brothers and sisters in Christ well. And so if he can provide a need, he's joyfully doing that for the glory of God. And so I want to call us to be that church. Let's be a church that is generous. And if somebody has need, like this is a generous church, let's keep pursuing that. Let's keep pursuing it, helping one another in need. Let's pray for that. God, who can I help this week? And they are giving exalt Jesus. Going back to my college days, we're back. Back to my college days. I, I, if you remember, I wasn't living to exalt Jesus. But during this whole season, during this whole season, God was at work. God was working in my life. And I say this because I know there's some of you here where you're like, man, Steve, I love Jesus. I'm just not there yet. I, I hear you live my life to exalt Jesus. I'm just not there yet. Like, I'm still entrapped to the sin. I, I'm still, it's hard for me to, to not find my identity in this world. I struggle. It's a daily struggle. I'm not there yet, Steve. And now I, I'm, I'm, I'm dep- like, what do I do? Like, look at verse 33. Notice how it said, great grace was on all of them. They weren't living this out. The early church wasn't doing any of this in their own strength. They weren't living unified together. They weren't living generously together. They weren't proclaiming Jesus in their own strength. They were doing it because God's grace was on them. God's grace was working in their lives and through them. So God's not through with you yet. He's working on you. Keep trusting in Jesus. Keep focusing on Jesus, that he has died and he has rose again. That he has come to free you so that you can live to exalt him. Keep and plead with Jesus. Let it be a daily thing that we plead with Jesus. Jesus, help me see that you are far better than the things of this world. You are far better, Jesus, than sin. You're far better, Jesus, than than what the world offers, than our stuff. You're, You're far better than living for Myself, Jesus. One day I remember, I don't remember exactly when, but it was right after college. It was like the scales fell off my eyes. And I know this was because of God's grace and work in my life. And it was like, with a flip of a switch, I realized, whoa, my life is not about impressing people. (laughs) And I was excited about that. I was comfortable in that. My life's not about exalting people. Myself, living for people, impressing people. My life is all about living to exalt Jesus. And you know what? By the grace of God, I said that prayer. (laughs) Jesus, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. It was scary, but I remember that. It was great joy in my life. God's not through with you yet. And so what is keeping you? What is keeping you from living your life to exalt Jesus. What is it? So I just want to lead us in a time of response before God. So if you just bow your heads with me, just close your eyes. And I just want you to to have this time between you and God. 
And I, I first, if, if you're not a follower of Jesus here today, like from on a scale of one out of ten, one being not certain, ten being for certain, like how certain are you? You have a relationship with Jesus. And if your answer is not 10 out of 10, you could become a follower of Jesus here today. You could become a follower of Jesus. Turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus. And you could just voice that in prayer to God. Say, God, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my sin and save me. I believe in Jesus, that he died for my sins and that he rose from the dead. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me live for you, Jesus. And if you are a follower of Jesus here today, you're following Jesus. Whatever is holding you back, holding us back from exalting Jesus with your life, will you lay that down right now? By the grace of God, will you lay it down? What is holding you back from living your life to exalt Jesus? Is it fear? Lay it down. Because God gives us boldness. Is it sin? You could turn from it because Jesus has freed us from that sin. He's better. Is it to live for yourself? See that living for Jesus and with one another is far better than living in isolation for yourself. Is it enslaved to your stuff, finding identity, serving your stuff as your God? Then see, pursue Jesus that he alone is God. That he is worthy. He speaks. Your stuff doesn't speak. He rules all things. Our stuff, we rule over it. What's holding you back? Will you lay it down today? Jesus, we, just, we exalt you, Jesus. We want to be a people that lives for you. Because you have saved us from our sins. You've given us life and you're so good, Jesus. You're far better than what, our, what this world offers. And Jesus, following you is hard in this world. It's hard. We need you, Jesus. We beg you, we cry out to you, Jesus, to help us. To see that you are far better. Like may we taste and see, Jesus, that you are good. And that when we taste and see that you are good every day of our lives, even when it's hard, even in tough circumstances, even when the world is telling us to follow it, to trust in it. May we taste and see, Jesus, that you are good. And may that lead us to exalt you with our lives. Like when we taste and see you, there's nothing else that we would rather exalt, glorify, and worship and praise than you, Jesus. So may we do this, Jesus. Please, we beg you. We need your help. Help us to lay down whatever it is that is keeping us from living for you and exalting you. We lay it down, Jesus, by your grace. Holy Spirit, help these people to lay it down and help us to follow you with great joy and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church family, let's stand and sing.